Cynthia, why don't we go ahead and get started? We can begin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we wanted to welcome everyone um, to the Firefighter Cancer Initiative seminar series. Today, we have Dr. Jeremy Baum from our Environmental Sampling Program presenting. Um, a couple just housekeeping items. If you have questions during the seminar, please type them in your Q&A function, um, not the chat, um, in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, in the Zoom window. You'll see that at any time you can type in questions and then uh, the presenter will respond to the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so please do feel free uh, to ask questions throughout. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Caban Martinez um, for a brief introduction of Dr. Jeremy Baum. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. And good afternoon, everyone. A uh, warm welcome from our Firefighter Cancer Initiative um, family. Today, it's my distinct privilege and pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Jeremy Baum, who's no stranger to our firefighters and to our scientific community. Um, today, we're, he's gonna be presenting um, uh, a project from our environmental sampling program. It's a really unique aspect of our FCI project that allows us to work in uh, transdisciplinary teams that traditionally don't get to work with each other, um, but are trying to understand how exposures encountered by firefighters uh, in the workplace um, you know, impact their health and particularly cancer. This is a really fun study that he's gonna be presenting to you, I think because we got to take our biochemistry family outside of the lab and bring them to a training facility um, to do some really interesting measurements of um, firefighter exposures <clears throat> uh, using radial heat maps. And this is actually something that um, our scientists had an idea about and our firefighters truly supported, wanting to understand sort of carcinogenic spread around um, an active fire situation. Um, so we're really excited um, to be able to present to you some of the pilot work uh, from this program. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Jeremy Baum, uh, to present the results. Dr. Baum. Yep. Uh, thank you, Alberto. And thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. Um, so today I'll be presenting about the progress that we made um, for FCI under the ESP, specifically on evaluating carcinogen exposure risk in active fire situations. I'll start with a brief introduction of what um, stimulated this project and then a glance of all the other projects that we've done um, under the ESP umbrella and before we dive into the main topic for today. Um, so the ESP, was all, all the projects under ESP stemmed from the fact that firefighters demonstrate um, a higher incidence of cancer compared to the general population. Uh, most notable increases um, were for malignant melanoma, testicular, mesothelioma, thyroid, and intestinal cancer. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, who is also part of the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, has done extensive work in creating a cancer linkage and registry at the national level, and he's been working with firefighters closely for a long time. Uh, most recently, he published a paper a manuscript on cancer risk among male and female firefighters. And we, and we know it's, it's very clear that firefighters are exposed to various carcinogens, which I'll cover today during the talk. But the, the question still remains, what, what is directly causing this increase in cancer? So two main goals for us to help better understand the exposure events that may be contributing to the cancer are to develop methods for documenting exposure and to evaluate exposure during various emergency calls. Um, for one of the first projects that fall under the ESP umbrella, and this one is probably gaining more attention as of late for many of you, and it's uh, looking at perfluoroalkyl substances, also known as PFAS. These are persistent organic pollutants or otherwise known as forever chemicals. They're extremely stable in the environment. They persist for a very long time and they can cause problems far beyond the initial source that they stemmed from or the location where they stemmed from. And this concern of these compounds is um, increased in, when it comes to firefighters because they, they encounter them in multiple different events. Not they're, they're in their turnout gear as a fire retardant in furniture and fire retardants and building materials. And when these materials catch fire, they actually uh, off gas and go into the environment where firefighters can be exposed to them. And then if that weren't enough, firefighters are also exposed to PFAS, specifically PFCAs, through their firefighting foams, the AFFF foams. 
So we've been working on this project for the last year or so um, to develop methods that we can use to detect these compounds in lab from different samples that we take at fire scenes. And we came up with a derivatization method that we can actually analyze these compounds. And we're happy to show and announce that we're able to detect, and these little arrows show this, detect various different um, PFAS compounds in a sample. So we're confident now that we can analyze these. Um, and another project that uh, falls under the ESP um, umbrella is the development of a novel passive sampler. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the silicone wristbands that uh, we use to document firefighter exposure directly. They're well, well validated um, from us and by others for use for this type of sampling technique, but we think there's still room for improvement. And our goal is to develop our own silicone material with uh, varying cross linkages and controlled pore density to uh, result in better absorption characteristics and a broader um, absorption uh, birth, if you will, to detect more compounds to get a full exposure picture of um, a firefighter um, event or day. Some initial preliminary work that we did in this project was uh, promising. We, we looked at two different types of uh, silicone matrices and we could see that the type one allowed for um, a greater um, absorption concentration than the type two. So this is promising and I'm really excited to see where this project will go in the next um, few years. And I already told you there's a lot of projects here in ESP, that's why I'm just giving a quick glance at them before we get into it, so bear with me. Um, but they're all very exciting and I wanna give them some uh, um, limelight as well. So th this project is uh, really great. It's, um, we, we are working on developing a real-time sensor that unlike the passive samplers, which only document exposure events after they have happened, this would provide firefighters capability to know the exposure risk in real time that they're experiencing in a given fire situation. This um, project started off where we had our samplers just stationary at a training fire, looked at the spike and signal, and then um, work, uh, worked from there to develop this into something more usable. We then put it on a rover and then eventually landed in gear because the end goal is to put the sensor into existing firefighter equipment or their turnout gear to not you know, encumber them with any additional equipment, but just provide a quick and simple warning system for the invisible dangers that are presented to them at a fire scene beyond the ones that they already know about. So there are gaseous sensors out there, but many of them um, only look at acute risk compounds. And for organic compounds, they only look at um, very high concentrations, nothing that is of chronic exposure risk. We've gone through a couple of different uh, phases. We started off uh, pretty large in an EMS bag. We've since migrated to this blue in the bottom right here, this blue small Pelican case. And this is currently out uh, testing with Chief Cantella, which is the Chief of Safety at Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department Training Safety Division. And he's been giving us valuable feedback for uh, multi um, various iterations that we're doing onto the system to make it easier to integrate. So we were adding more and more things to the sensors, improving how they change the batteries and so forth. And then while this is still out and the testing model that we're evaluating with firefighters in the lab, we're currently working on an even smaller version. This 3D printed box right here is the, the latest version that is in the developmental stage. So it's not even running yet, but it's based off of the size of a um, gauze box. So this would just slide right into the existing gear that firefighters are already using, and it only displaces one of their little um, gauze boxes. Then an, an additional project. So all the previous projects that I just showed you are related to the external exposure events that firefighters see. Uh, another interesting one, and this one is unique because we look at internal exposure. And as you can see in the figure, we collect um, urine samples and uh, vaginal swabs from um, firefighters. And we look 
for PAHs through uh, pressurized solvent extraction. We extract the, the samples that they provided, and then in GCMS analysis, we determine the concentrations of the PAHs present. For um, the vaginal swabs, we also look at how PAHs and other carcinogens that they may have been exposed to affect the vaginal microbiome. And this is done through uh, um, the DNA analysis of the um, vaginal microbiome and looking at the profile changes in these uh, in the microbiome from the exposure events. So this is another you know, very exciting project, which I'm sure you'll hear more about in the future. And then. Since we're going to be talking about environments and fire situations, I figured the, the last of the, the additional projects under ESP that I would uh, talk about before getting into the meat of this talk was the sampling in disaster, disaster response environments. Um, this project was inspired by our observations that firefighters responding to natural disasters um, are presented with a huge amount of destruction, especially here in Florida, um, hurricanes. This was um, Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael in 2018. We went up there and as Alberto pointed out, we, we had the privilege to, <clears throat> to sample and, and be and leave the lab for once and see how it is when you have to uh, um, interact with, uh, with the public and, and get, a, get a feel of what's going on. It was very impactful. Um, but of note for the exposure, all, all this debris also redistributes um, contaminants. So if it's close to a super fun site, which is a containment site for um, very bad contaminants, or even just uh, machinery that has been destroyed or facilities that are close by for, for chemical plants, something like that, these compounds may have been transported from miles away from where they originated and firefighters are not aware what they're being exposed to. So it's very you know, important um, to, to determine what are the compounds present in such an event because firefighters will stage, um, in this case, so somewhat you know, primitive. It's not, they're just out there in the middle of this destruction zone and they've staged their control area and they're, they're constantly surrounded by all these unknown risks. So we, we look at a lot of these persistent organic pollutants, PCBs, polybrominated biphenyls, phthalates, PBDEs, uh, PFAS, as discussed earlier. And then, of course, um, poly, <clears throat> polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are the, they're going to be the focus of today's talk. So before... Um, getting into how firefighters are exposed to these polyaromatic hydrocarbons, I thought it would make sense to give you a, a quick overview of how PHs are created and where they come from. The most obvious source are structure fires and then um, vehicle fires, but also um, the industry and manufacturing. Within a given uh, fire, particularly fires with um, low oxygen and high fuel amounts. In the, the lower regions of the fire, you initially have the formation of small radicals that help stimulate the first ring structures. Then the first pH growth uh, start to appear through um, pH, pH radical reactions. And then you start to get more and more growth of pHs. And once you get into the upper regions of the flame, where also the temperature has now started to rise, you start to get um, growth behaviors that aren't dominated by uh, radical reactions as much anymore, but more by gaseous pH addition. And we're starting to get into the one to two nanometer range, and you start to see small soot particles develop and formation of a few buckyballs. When we get into the fourth stage of this pH formation and soot growth, the dominant factor is sticky particle collisions and mass addition. And the soot particles start to grow and grow. And then in the final phase, some carbonization takes place and you start to form uh, graphene sheets or fragments of graphene sheets. And you get these loosely bound soot particles combined in a full of absorbed with PAHs, which are then um, transported into the atmosphere through thermal drafts. And these can then go far away from the initial fire source 
And then in clouds, they rain back down into the environment. They bioaccumulate in plants and animals. And then for humans, the dominant route of exposure is through ingestion. And while firefighters also eat that, and they have um, their pH exposure that way, there's an additional risk, which we hope to elucidate here and uh, how they're exposed otherwise. So explain to you where pHs come from. So I also want to say, uh, explain what happens after um, you've been exposed and pHs have been internalized. Well, there's not that much research done in all of the pHs. So for some answers, we turn to benzoapyrene, which is one of the most well-studied pHs. It's also a, it's classified as a group one carcinogen to humans. And looking at that one, there's a general consensus that the dominating metabolic pathway um, of damage is through the activation of the xenobiotic metabolism, which initially converts, I don't want to say benign because that's really a bad term to use for pHs, but it uses a less harm, it starts with a less harmful pH that our body is trying to remove. Um, and during the oxidative process, creates a more harmful substance that can then um, yeah, increase uh, the chances of cancer through um, a couple of different pathways. So the one is increased increase DNA damage. The other is induction of the P53 protein um, mutant, which when it's not the mutant is really a guardian angel protein of sorts that helps uh, control uh, cell growth. But when it's broken, it just lets cell growth go rampant, which results in delayed tissue repair and increased uh, chances of cancer. And then there's just the overall um, increased inflammation, which is uh, bad for, um, for the body. So we know where pHs come from. We know the, some of the possibilities that can uh, lead to um, cancer when, when you're internalizing pHs. But then the next goal is to determine the exposure events that lead to internalizing the pHs in the first place. So the first one is pretty obvious. I like to use this uh, contamination exposure cycle. In the first event, it's the fire source. When a firefighter is present at the, on the scene, they're fighting the fire, pHs are being generated in the flames and they're everywhere. So they're absorbing onto their gear. If they're not wearing protective uh, breathing apparatus or on contained air, then they may be exposing their skin, internalizing through the skin or even into the lungs directly. And then they have their contaminated gear, which they transport to the, um, in the fire engine back to the fire station and their personal vehicle, possibly to the home. And um, Dr. Caban Martinez did some early work using UV dye to demonstrate this, this transfer from the fire station to the personal vehicle into the home where firefighters, where they had this invisible dye on their hands and they interacted with the child and, that, and then the child went home and you could, you could see this um, transfer of, uh, con of theoretical contamination down this chain. On the top left here in image A, we have some firefighter gear where we're examining the off-gassing potential of this gear from this contamination cycle. And we documented um, high soot particle counts, which I explained earlier, right, contains a lot of PAHs. So there's soot particles in the gas above the gear. And then B, we have on image B on the right, we have the infamous uh, silicone wristbands that we use for documenting personalized uh, exposure events on firefighters. And then on bottom right here in C, we have the uh, rover, which has, this was a way to mobilize our um, real-time sensors during testing phases. So I already mentioned a little bit about silicone wristbands and they're, they're a great way of doing passive sampling because they're cheap, durable, and they can handle and withstand the firefighter environment. And they're also lightweight, so they don't really um, affect anyone's um, behavior or day to day activities. But they also function as passive samplers for um, environmental sampling. So, and that's because they can absorb the same compounds that we're interested in in a personal sampling event versus the um, sampling event for an environmental sample. <clears throat> and another reason that these samplers are ideal is their, their storage capability. So after 
they've been exposed, unless the temperature is raised extremely, the compounds stay stable on the wristbands and we can bring them back to the lab and analyze them. So obviously, even though these are simple to use, they do require some uh, workup prior to using them. You can't just purchase them uh, online and then use them for analysis. So for the um, preparatory step, we take the, the wristbands, put them um, through different solvent treatments and extraction steps to remove any trace contaminants. And then with um, a vacuum oven, we make sure all the solvents have been removed so they're extremely clean. Then they go into airtight containers and they're stored either for when we need to bring them into the field for our um, environmental sampling or we distribute them to firefighters. And then afterwards, after an exposure event, bring them back to the lab, extract them, and then um, analyze them in GCMS to look at the exposure profiles and concentrations. I thought it would make sense to give everyone a brief overview of a fire um, suppression zone and um, area. And so, because all the firefighters on the call obviously understand this better than I do, but for a lot of us, we want, I wanted to have a understanding that everyone knows how these things are um, laid out. So here in the middle, you have your structure fire, and then you have your warm or your hot, the hot zone around that, and your warm zone and the cold zone. When, uh, when a firefighter arrives at the scene, usually the lead firefighter or the safety officer on duty will establish these zones. They also have them place their command post and the access control area. In an ideal situation, all this is upwind of the, um, the fire zone. And then they, um, from this area, they also control access to the access corridor. There's a staging area where firefighters prep for entering into the fire. And then there's the medical area which can transition between the warm zone and the cold zone. And the, the questions that come up for us were, you know, what distances from a fire scene are considered safe? How do they establish these? Uh, when should a firefighter be on contained air? And if any other equipment is needed within the warm and cold zone. And then this may be less obvious for, for some firefighters, but what is like the cumulative exposure risk, not just the immediate threat to life in these given zones? So to not risk our lives while we were doing these experiments, we didn't go to a random fire call. We decided that uh, live fire training situations were a more controlled environment for us to work in. These are real fires conducted in a controlled manner by firefighters for their individual training events that they um, hold for rookie firefighters. So it just presented an ideal situation for us. In this particular setup, we had a um, northeasterly wind and distributed our um, passive samplers at varying distances radially from the fire zone through the hot zone, which for most cases is just considered the immediate threat to life zone. And then the cold zone in this scenario was considered generally safe. So there was no protective gear worn and we were also allowed to be in that zone. And then the interesting one for firefighters, I think, is the warm zone, because there, there isn't really a clear cut guideline on how and when PPE is enforced. And that may vary between fire departments or fire events individually. And then also because if you remember the slide before, this is also the zone where EMS activity can take place in transition between the warm and cold zone. So we hope to highlight some of the concerns that we have and maybe that can be used to better guide uh, or set, to help uh, establish guidelines for these two other zones. And this image here on the right shows the, the actual passive samplers that we distributed um, for this uh, fire event. And we placed them roughly at chest height to simulate a firefighter standing there for the, the whole event. For this uh, first data set, I wanted to show the aggregate uh, pH exposure. And we looked at two different fire events, um, a class A fire and a class B fire. 
the class A fire is um, more of um, biofuels, so wood and hay. And the class B fire um, stems from liquid fuels like uh, butane um, or gasoline. Uh, for the class A fire on this day, it was a northeasterly wind and our samplers were distributed in, a, in the um, southeasterly quadrant. And for the class B fire, we had a northwesterly wind and the samplers were placed in the northeasterly quadrant. When you're looking at the color distribution, just the for the heat map, the darker the color, the higher the concentration, and the lighter the color, the less the um, concentration of pHs that we found. And you can see these don't follow a uniform distribution pattern that you would expect something emanating away from a heated source. You expect some type of you know, linear fallout or a uniform fallout. That didn't happen. We actually observed a deposition front for each of these fire events. Um, for the class A fire, we saw the strongest concentration at the 40 feet mark. And for the class B fire, this it's a little bit harder to determine or to see, but it was roughly at the 20 to 25 um, feet mark where we observed the highest concentration. Um, for the class A fire, there was a 51% higher heavyweight pH exposure. And for the class B fire, there was a 64% higher lightweight pH exposure. The heavyweight pHs, like benzoate, pyrene, are the pHs that are of greater concern because they just observe more carcinogenic activity than the lightweight pHs. That's why we separated them. But there's also a um, behavioral difference in terms of the pH growth and the soot and particle addition. So, to look at those behaviors, we separated these compounds. So first we'll talk about the class A a little bit more. So for the lightweight pHs or the low molecular weight pHs, you can see there was a more uniform distribution across all distances. And you can see the heavyweight or the high molecular weight pHs were the ones or, um, creating that and dominating the um, deposition front effect that we saw. And that makes a lot of sense in our opinion because the, the heavyweight pHs are more likely to bind to these particles, the, the soot particles that are, and then observe, would uh, result in difference in behavior. On average, and this is, uh, I think, really important to highlight, on average, we saw 160 parts per billion pH aggregate exposure in the warm zone and 175 for the cold zone. Both of these numbers are extremely high in concerning um, numbers for pH exposure. But the cold zone is you know, like must be highlighted because it's supposed to be the area that was considered safe. And there was people in that region without that were not on um, contained air. For the class B fire, we still see the same behavior, but at a, to, a, to a lesser extent. So the, the class B fires, you see here's this deposition front again for the, the low molecular weight. And here it is again for the high molecular weight. And the average exposure was 60 parts per billion and 40 parts per billion for the warm and cold zone respectively. So much lower than the class A fires, but still these are concerning levels of exposure. For one, one special exposure, and it's still a class A fire, we looked at the flashover simulations while we're in St. Petersburg. And this is a this was a fire where firefighters voiced their concerns over the high exposure levels before we had even talked to them about our radio heat maps and wristbands. And it's just because it's such a dirty fire. If you look at the top image on the left, you can see all this white smoke. And for, for a training event, this is you know, a, a lot, a lot of um, off-gassing going on here. So we, we analyzed uh, the firefighters there individually, and these are the results. So on the, each column represents a individual firefighter's uh, exposure to 
um, from that training event. And we separated by each of the PHs that we were looking at. And I don't want to go through each one of these individually, but I would like to highlight uh, benzoapyrene, the group one carcinogen here. And this exposure amount across the board is extremely concerning. These are um, tenfold higher than the EU guidelines for benzoapyrene. There, there aren't really decent guidelines in the US for pH exposure um, particularly. We, we, they do use coal tar pitch volatiles, but it's just not a good, um, a good way to look at pH exposure. So the only one that I could find that makes somewhat sense is benzoapyrene specifically by itself. But, um, and that alone is you know, already a concerning level of exposure. So you know, if the firefighters deem the flashover simulators are necessary for the safety of firefighters during their, for their training in their future, I think perhaps maybe uh, increased decontamination after such an event would help uh, remove the contamination that they're seeing. So just to, to provide some you know, a final overview of what we observe, uh, the class of fire or the fuel type had a significant impact on the exposure amounts observed in firefighters. And the warm and cold zone across both fire types showed extremely high exposure averages for all the uh, um, firefighter, um, all the samplers that we had out there. So the graph on the left is showing the exposure on the firefighters, right? So personal exposure that we monitored and the averages were from the passive samplers that we distributed radially on those um, heat maps. And then this image here, you can see here are a lot of firefighters prepared to go into this uh, training burn structure and they're all on contained air. And then only 20 feet away, you have um, some training officers that are just sitting there. And this is 20 feet away. The cold zone that we were measuring was actually 75 feet away in this particular event. I'm sorry, the one on the above the top. So you can see the exposure potential is extremely high. We're happy also to see that firefighters are adopting and training for new contamination tech, uh, decontamination techniques. Um, but overall, just you know, these these events still showed high concentrations of pHs well above the safe levels, and particularly in the warm and cold zone which hopefully there's a way to adapt those um, considerations into establishing these two zones. And fire type plays an obvious role in the pH con um, concentrations we found in all the fire events. And the unique pH transport that we observed is gonna require some more um, investigation. We want to prove why our pH is um, distributing non-linearly and depositing at different intervals at different rates. And this was uh, our team you know, right here. And this was the um, flashover simulator burning out in the background. And with that, I would uh, like to acknowledge everyone that helped make this possible. So um, for a lot of our projects, we have uh, Alexia, Umer, and Chipan. They, they help with the um, all those other projects that fall under the ESP umbrella. And um, there's Dr. Caban Martinez, and Dr. Sylvia Donnert, and um, Dr. Sapadeo, which are the, the PIs behind the ESP project. Here is the Sylvia, I'm um, sorry, the Donnert Deo laboratory group. And up here is the the whole FCI family. And with that, I think I, I will open these to uh, questions. Jeremy, we do have one question um, in the Q&A. Uh, okay. Are silicone wristbands available for fire investigator studies? That is a wonderful question. Um, we are already... Uh, working with uh, some firefighter investigators. So yes, they are available. Um, 
I don't know to which extent. I think uh, Dr. Caban will be able to provide a little bit more uh, clarity there. But uh, in principle, yes, we, we are using silicon wristbands with investigators. Are there any other questions? Because I can't see the oh, there's the Q and A. How, How did you yeah. set up your class B fire? Was it propane? I believe it was propane. Yes. Any other questions? Jeremy, you did a great job. That's why there are no other questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> There is a question, Cynthia. Oh, yes. 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 Third, how will you push this information out besides this presentation? I, I believe Ooh. I can take the beginning of that. Um, so we have various, um, right now with COVID, we really have uh, tried to increase our presence online through social media, um, through our monthly newsletters that we've had uh, this project period. So we are trying to put it out there. Um, we definitely are sending out all of our information when we're in the field and doing different um, station visits. And maybe uh, Dr. Sali would like to speak to this, um, but all of our projects, um, we're definitely you know, moving this research into um, you know, all of our educational uh, curriculum as well as our National Firefighter Cancer Symposium um, that'll be held, a little plug, um, June 10th through 12th. Um, so much research and conversation will be held there. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Saleh, if you'd like to speak specifically about disseminating information um, from FCI research into the firefighter community and our communication um, with various you know, departments and uh, different constituencies within the fire service. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in, I would say prior to COVID, it was really easy. We would be at several conferences a year, several events, um, but we are more than happy to present our work, uh, you know, at a department-wide um, meeting. If you wanted to hold a Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting um, presentation or seminar like this, where we would be able to present. Um, we also have our website that is on Sylvester. Um, Sylvester was a website. You just have to search for firefighters. You'll find our FCI website. Um, all of these recordings are there as well as other recordings from our other seminars and um, our publications are there. So you're able to get that information. Um, and then the other thing that we work on um, is our education program. So we, we create a lot of education materials that are also can be found on the website that you're able to share with both your leadership and firefighters. Um, so they, you know, have kind of right in your face information about what's going on. Um, we know we try to use graphics, uh, make it very easy to see, um, to understand rather than some of these, um, you know, graphs and figures, but really what can they do in their everyday work life to make changes and you know decrease their risk their exposure um so yeah so i think that covers it. and the other thing um you know yearly we have our, our national symposium which again we will be having this june um, we will be taking a hybrid approach so we'll be online for anyone that would like to um join us we'd, we'd love to have you and um yeah i think that's about it we did have one more question. Um, what would be next steps for changing practice at the fire scene moving forward? Oh, I'm the chemist. That's probably not a good question for me. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll leave that up to um, Natasha or Alberto to answer. Um, yeah, I mean, so right now, um, you know, from the work that we've done and the work that Jeremy and um, his group has and his group has found, especially with the the warm zone and how people may still be at risk, even though they they're not standing in what was considered the hot zone. Um, we've already seen changes, especially with the decon buckets and things of that nature that people are doing on scene. Um, you know, as far as next steps for changing practice, I think just just educating departments that aren't doing it. Uh, we have seen big changes from departments here in Florida, um, but really to share that knowledge at a national level to, you know, make the on-scene decon a, you know, second nature to everybody. Um, yeah. if Dr. Caban Martinez is on, if, if he has anything else to add for changing practices at the fire scene. Yeah, like uh, in general, like what what um, what can be done? I think you covered. I think you covered most of them. I think part of it is um, also, you know, just starting a, a face team. I, you know, I always look at our Palm Beach County Fire Rescues um, Fire Department as an example of how a concerned group of firefighters can really serve as a catalyst to change policies, programs, and practices within the fire department. Um, and then having you know the senior leadership support, like the fire chief and the assistant chief support this phase team can really help uh, do some of those transformations about best practices, um, both within the fire department, within the fire station, and then out during fire suppression and incident response. So I, I think it's really getting top leadership involved and saying, okay, let's make a phase team and how do we make implement some of these um, changes? Wonderful. I think those are all the questions that we have um, in the Q&A function. I wanted to say thank you so much, Jeremy, a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you for everyone who joined and um, thank you so much for the support of all of our PIs at the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, Dr. Sylvia Donnert, um, Dr. Sapna Deo, Dr. Natasha Schaefer-Sali and Dr. Alberto Caban martinez um, for their leadership and all of these efforts and, and all of the work um, from the FCI team. We really appreciate it, but we do want to always say that we couldn't do this alone um, and that our partners in the fire service and our collaborators um, really make all of this possible and drive so much of, of what we do. So we want to say thank you, as always. Um, and I also have one more plug um, for the Dolphins Challenge Cancer. It is on <laughs> April 10th. Um, we have a Team Hurricanes Firefighters versus Cancer team. Um, we have received, um, we're happy to announce that we've received some support um, to cover the minimum fundraising for firefighters who would like to participate. Um, so any firefighter who would like to participate in Dolphins Challenge Cancer on April 10th at Hard Rock Stadium to walk the 5K in their bunker gear, um, the minimum fundraising that's required for the 5K walk will be covered. If you are interested um, and you'd like to participate and join us in the walk, um, you please email us at firefighterstudy at miami.edu. Um, so that's our email address, firefighterstudy at miami.edu. Um, and we can connect there. We've also sent that out through our social media channels. Um, so all the information is there as well. But I'd like to say, well, on that note, uh, thank you everyone for participating and thank you for joining us. Um, another very successful FCI seminar. Appreciate your attendance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take everyone. care. Bye. Bye. Take care.